Hello, and welcome to Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. We are so glad you've joined us. Before we jump into today's episode, we would like to tell you about one of the resources we use at Higher Aim to encourage hearts and empower lives, and that's our monthly Bible teaching letter. In each letter, Dr. Kurt Dodd gives you a more in-depth look at the topic of one of his sermons and helps you dive deeper as you study God's Word. The letter is delivered to your home each month and is absolutely free. To begin receiving your monthly Bible teaching letter, visit our website at higheraim.org and click on the teaching letter option at the top of the screen. You can also call our help center at 1-800-491-4400 as operators are standing by now to help you register for the Bible teaching letter. We hope this resource is a blessing to you as you continue to grow in your walk with Christ. Now, please enjoy today's message from Dr. Kurt Dodd. So, why don't you take your copy of God's Word and focus in in John chapter 13. As you know, we're in a series that we've been calling the Word, Ha Logos, as we've studied the prologue of John, and now we're in a mini-series within the series called Show and Tell. Because in verse 18 of John chapter 1, the Bible gives us a glimpse that Jesus is making known to us everything we need to know about the Father, what He's thinking, what He wants, how He wants to relate to us. And it's important for us to grab hold of that. And for the rest of John's gospel, what we're doing is taking a a bird's eye view of some of the key principles that God would have us grasp. And today, I I want us to look at one because this is true of all of us. Here it is. Here's this key principle. God knows that we often make promises to Him we can't keep. (laughs) Have you ever played let's make a deal with God? God, I'll do this if you'll do that. And guess what? God does that, but you don't do this. Have you ever done that? There's probably not one of us in this place that has not tried to make a deal with God, and we have fallen flat on our face. Failure seems to be part of life. In fact, today what I want to do is to turn this to grab hold of how to handle failure in a positive way. That's where we're going today, how to handle failure failure in a positive way. And if there was anyone who could teach us about failure, of all the disciples, it's Simon Peter. I mean, he was pretty good at failure, just like all of us. That's one of the reasons you know the Bible is true, because it reveals the the negative as well as the positive of all its characters. There is no uh, sugar coating of anyone in Scripture. It just tells the truth. And there in chapter 13, verses 31 through 38, we read these words. Here it comes. When he was gone, and this is referring to Judas, who had planned to betray Jesus, he'd gone from the upper room. Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. In fact, just a couple of chapters later, he did. You know the story, don't you? 
And so it's important for us to understand that just like Simon Peter, many of us have to deal with failure. And I'm going to give you a couple of things that I think are important. Sometimes our failure is set up because we have focused on the wrong thing. Jesus was trying to tell them, because I'm leaving, I want you to love one another. And he shares more words about loving one another than leaving. Simon Peter he had selective hearing. He was focusing on following Jesus, and he was, he was focused on, why can't I go with you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Many of us, we set up our failure because of our selective hearing. We hear what we want to hear. Um, ladies, I, I know that maybe you're married to a man who you would say, you only hear what you want to hear. Uh, I know that that's a common thing that wives say about their husbands, but let me just tell you something. That's also a common thing of women, too. You know, I, I know for a fact that anytime my wife hears the word sale in a sentence, it doesn't make any difference what the rest of the sentence is. She's going to save me a lot of money, and I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm saying. Many of us, our failure comes because we've had selective hearing. Oh. Sometimes our failure is set up because we are full of our own bravado. Simon Peter was trying to distance himself from the other disciples by saying, I will lay down my life for you. You notice that none of the other disciples were that committed, at least in their words. And he was full of himself. Many of us, our failure is a result of that too. Sometimes our failure is set up because we just make promises we haven't prepared ourselves to keep. I mean, we, we make them. We make those promises, but we haven't done what it takes to keep those promises. When we first followed Christ and we gave our life to Jesus, Many of us did not realize that there are some things that you must do in discipline in your life to keep following Christ, like prayer, Bible study, fellowship with other believers, the discipline to study the Word of God. If you're going to sustain a promise, you must do those things necessary to sustain that promise. The same thing is true with marriage. We are living in a day and time where people are more emotionally driven and emotionally committed until they're not. But the moment you said, I do, you know what you were saying? You were saying, I do, I'm in, I'm committed in the good times as well as the bad times. But many people look to jump in the bad times because they have not prepared in advance to do the things they needed to do in order to keep the commitment strong. Now, I've told you before that I have never, ever considered divorce, ever. Murder several times has come to my mind, but not divorce. Let me just tell you something. Marriage is difficult on a good day, but it's even more difficult when you go through difficult seasons in life. And guess what? Guys, your wife's going to have a difficult season at one time or another. Ladies, your husband's going to go through some real challenges, and you're going to have to go through them together, and you need to make a commitment to go through those times. Therefore, you cannot live just on the fumes of emotion or, or the feelings of love. Love is something you do. It is not something you feel. The feelings will ebb and flow. And many of us, we set ourselves up for failure because we are not willing to do whatever it takes to sustain a commitment. And Simon Peter had problems too in that area. And many of us just, well, we set ourselves up for failure over and over again. Sometimes our failure is set up because we refuse to believe the truth about ourselves. Just a couple of chapters later, hours, quite frankly, hours would go by and Simon Peter would fulfill the words of Jesus. Oh, man, he wasn't willing to believe the truth about himself, that in our flesh dwells no good thing. You know, there are some people that have had some great statements about failure. It was Abraham Lincoln who 
probably knew about failure more than any politician. He, he lost more elections than he won. Did you know that? And he said this, my great concern is not whether you have failed, but whether you are content with your failure. Many of us, we try to justify our failure or be content with it rather than learn from it. It was C.S. Lewis who said this, failures, repeated failures, are finger posts on the road to achievement. One fails forward to success. Probably one of my favorite quotes of all is Thomas Edison, who said it like this, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And maybe that's where you are. You found something that won't, won't work. Just don't keep doing it the same way. That's what insanity is, doing the same thing, the same way, expecting different results. And when you find yourself in the midst of failure, you got to find the way out. So what I want to do is to put a positive spin on Simon Peter's failure and walk down this path with you today. First of all, I want to talk to you about the how-tos. How do you handle failure in a positive way? Let me give them to you. Number one, own it. When you fail, own it. Embrace it. Don't make excuses for it. Just own it. Personal failure is inevitable in our lives. The spiritual failure is inevitable. I, I wish I could tell you the moment you say yes to Jesus, your life will be a skyrocket to heaven, and you will only be on a, a straight upward path the rest of your life. That's not true. Most of our spiritual lives, we start strong, and then we dip. It's like a roller coaster ride or a pinball machine. But God knows that. He knows that about his followers. But regardless, when you fail, own it. When you sin, own it. Don't make excuses for it. <clears throat> also, I would tell you, never compare your failure to someone else's. That's one good thing that I like about Simon Peter here. He, when he failed, when he sinned, when he denied Christ, he wasn't pointing the finger at anybody else. And that's what you and I need to do. Never compare our, compare our failure to someone else. That's like a kid coming home from class who made an F on his test and say, well, everybody else failed too. The problem is you're on a journey with Christ, and he's not comparing you, you to anyone else, and he's not comparing anyone else to you. You're on a journey with him, so don't go there. I would also tell you you need to feel it. When you fail, feel it. This is very, very important. One of the things that we're finding in Scripture is just real clarity here because there in Matthew 26, verse 75, we read these words about feeling. Watch this. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Read this out loud with me. And he went outside and what? Wept bitterly. I mean, he was broken. <sighs> he allowed himself to feel it and to express it. Now, let me just tell you who Simon Peter was. He was a rugged fisherman from the area of Capernaum. But he was emotional. I got a feeling that when he caught fish, he got all excited. And when he wept, he wept bitterly. There was no in-between with Simon Peter, but he is a great example for us to follow here. When you fail, you need to feel it. Many of us, when we fail, you know what we do? Well, we ignore it, or we push it down. And we think that if we don't feel it, it'll go away eventually. But the problem is, it won't go away. The only way that it will go away is for you to go through that grief of the pain of your personal failure and sin. You know what dysfunction is? Dysfunction is the disconnect of pain from the event. And the greatest thing any counselor could ever do 
with someone who is trying to process an event in their life is to help them embrace and feel the pain. But that's the last thing any of us want to do. We want to push it down and, and stomp on it and act like it it does not exist, but the only way that you will ever be set free from the pain of failure is to come to the place where you not only own it and you don't compare anybody else to it, but you allow yourself to feel the pain. I pray you think about that because I know that God wants you to get all the way through and you want to get all the way through too, don't you? So don't be afraid to feel it. Also, you need to express remorse appropriately. Now, there is a difference between how Judas responded and Simon Peter responded. Judas betrayed Jesus. Simon Peter denied him three different times, not once, but three. Some have said that the reason why Judas betrayed Jesus was that he was trying to force his hand. He knew Jesus was powerful. And in the back of his mind, he knew that if he could force Jesus' hand, that he would step up and become the Messiah that they had always expected him to be, one who would call the Jewish people to revolt and throw off the shackles of the Roman uh, oppression. And Jesus didn't respond like that. And the Bible tells us that Judas was full of remorse. And he went out and he hung himself and he died. He took the money and threw it back at the priest trying to say, stop this. You can have the 30 shekels of silver. But he just was remorseful. He was remorseful that it didn't work out, that his plan didn't work out, that it caused some pain. It didn't go the way he planned. He was remorseful that it didn't work. Simon Peter was a different kind of response, which you and I need to grab hold of. Learn to express remorse appropriately, which would lead you to repent. Repent. You know what repentance is? It literally means uh, to change your way of thinking. It comes to the place in your life spiritually, if you're going to truly repent of sin that caused failure, you've got to own the sin acknowledge the sin, feel it, and come to the place to where you turn from it and you are remorseful enough to turn your back and move in a different direction away from that previous action. Repentance, repentance is a very key thing. How long should you repent until God says you're through? That's the answer. Many of us, we pray this prayer. God, please forgive me of all my sins. And I know the Father's probably saying, which one? Which one? Sin should be confessed and repented of as specifically as it's committed. And stay there long enough until the Lord says, okay, you've repented enough. I believe that you really have made up your mind to go in the right direction. Stay there. I would also tell you that the Scripture is very clear that after there's repentance, you need to do this, seek restoration. Seek restoration. You know when Jesus came alive from the grave, he would appear multiple times. But Simon Peter was looking for a moment where he could have a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus to make things right. And there, near the area where Jesus had called him to follow him, there was a, a post-resurrection appearance of Christ. He's on the side of the shore. You read about this in John 21. And they've been fishing all night. Jesus yells from the shore, have you caught any fish? And they don't recognize him immediately. And they say, no, we've been fishing all night. And he says, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Let me just tell you, fishermen will try anything. If they haven't caught anything, they'll try any kind of lure. Whatever it takes to catch fish, they try. So they pull the nets up and throw it over on the other side. They catch 153 fish. Just then one of the disciples says, I think it's the Lord. 
Without hesitation, Simon Peter jumps out of the boat and gets to the shore first to have an encounter with Christ. Because you know what he's doing? He's seeking restoration. He had repented. He was broken. He had wept bitterly. But he wanted to make sure things were right between he and Jesus. Now, let me just tell you, you may not be able to fix it now. If you have failed someone and you are seeking restoration, you may not be able to fix it right now, but you need to make, make progress to seek that person out. Don't avoid them. If you have failed someone, don't avoid them. Whatever you do, don't act like it didn't happen because it did, and they remember it. Even though they may not bring it up, they remember it. And that's important for us to grab hold of. I would also tell you, embrace forgiveness. Embrace forgiveness. Begin again where you are. When God forgives you, embrace it. Thank him for the forgiveness first. And then that will lead you to second act like you're forgiving. You, if you act like you are forgiven, that's going to lead you to service, humility, and praise. And so, therefore, you've got to embrace forgiveness and realize God wants to give you a brand new beginning. Brand new beginning. Failure is, is not uh, ongoing unless you stay there by your actions. God wants you to push all the way through. So that's important. But still there are some questions. I'm going to talk to you very quickly about the what ifs. What ifs? Well, number one, what if your failure resulted in producing a life-changing event for another? And there is an ongoing consequence for how you failed. What do you do? How do you handle that kind of failure? I will tell you this. Remember what Simon Peter did. He denied Jesus, but that did not affect God's plan for his son. Do you understand that? Jesus was on a trajectory all the way to the cross, and he knew it before. And though Simon Peter failed along the way, it did not affect what God was planning to do through Christ. I want you to grab hold of this. It just may be that God will use your failure to shape not only you, but the trajectory of someone else's life. You understand that God's in charge? He's in charge. He's large and he's in charge. And don't think that your failure happens in a vacuum that it caught God off guard. Like, like you failed and, and the Lord's up there in heaven going, whoa, can't believe that happened. They did that? Unbelievable. No, he knew it, just like Jesus knew it. But what God will often do is to take your failure and use them in your life to shape your life, and you will use also the failure of other people in your life to shape your design. Do you understand that? Do you grab hold of the fact that it is often through the broken pieces of our lives that God makes us into the image of that he wants us really to be. And you cannot tiptoe around that. So therefore, you must understand that when you fail and it affects others, that was still part of God's plan. And he's planning to use it in their lives as well as yours. Grab hold of that. That's what happens with Simon Peter. It happens here too. Well, what if... You can't get failure out of your mind. There's some of us here who are watching my television and who are here right now. You are stuck in failure of the past. And you, you, it's like you have a rewind button. Once you go through it, you rewind it again and you can't get out of it. And you've been trying to get that past failure out of your mind over and over and over again. It just won't ever leave you. So what do you do? Stop trying to get it out of your mind because you, you can't. It's a part of your story. So therefore, you've got to use it to maintain traction to get moving forward. It is part of your life. It is one of the events in your life. Now, Simon Peter would become the preacher at Pentecost, 
But yes, he was also the one who denied Jesus three times a month and a half before. Do you understand that? That's part of his story. And you and I will have some great moments in, in our lives where we serve Jesus in an awesome way. But there will also be moments in your story and my story where we failed miserably. There will be times in your life where you were the greatest spouse any person could ever have. And then there will be times in your story that people will have to go, not so much, not so much. That's just part of your life, part of your story, and allow God to use that. What if, what if the person you hurt refuses to forgive you? Here's the deal. You can't make somebody forgive you. You can seek restoration, but if they refuse, give them time. Give them time. Back away. Seek restoration, but if they do not want to be restored and they're not ready, cut them some slack, give them some time. It's been said that time heals all wounds and wounds all heals. Let me just say this to you. Forgiveness and restoration is kind of like sex. That ought to get your attention. It's been said like this, that women are crockpots. Men are microwave ovens. The same thing is true in the area of forgiveness. Men, when they say, I messed up, I blew it, I'm so sorry, please forgive me, they, they want to move on quickly. And they can go to another man to say, hey, I, I'm sorry, I messed up, I would you forgive me for what I did? Can we start again? Can we push, push the reset button? And most guys would go, sure. We'll get on down the road. We'll begin again. Women, not so much. You tell a woman, I blew it. And they look at you and go, yes, you did. You know you did. And you ask her for forgiveness. It's going to take a while before those feelings will begin to flow again because you've hurt them deep on the inside. And the forgiveness and the restoration has to percolate a little bit longer. That's how we're wired. So therefore, you and I just need to give people time, give people space. Not everybody operates the same way. Therefore, if someone refuses to forgive you, let the Lord take them on the journey because for them to forgive is, is as important as it is for you to repent and seek restoration. Let me just give you a quick thought here. Unforgiveness does more damage in the vessel in which it is stored than on the person on which it is poured. It'll tear you up if you don't forgive. You know that, don't you? But give someone space for restoration. I would also tell you, what if your failure alters your trajectory in life? You blew it. You blew it bad. And now it has changed the direction of your life. What do you do? Here's what you got to do. Thank the Lord for a new beginning. Stop being your own victim. Choose to move forward. There comes a moment in time where you've got to stop wallowing in your failure in the past. And once you've asked for forgiveness, sought restoration, truly repented, you've got to begin to move on and understand that just as God may have used a failure to shape someone else's life, he is using your failure to shape the direction of your life too. So you need to move on through and begin to live your life like God wants you to live it. Now, let me give you the now what's. What do you need to do? in the midst of turning failure into a positive way. First of all, I, I would tell you, begin again. If you failed, begin again. That is very, very important. You, you can't remain stuck. You've got to move on through. Begin again. Second, learn all you can from your failure about yourself, 
about God. And guess what? You're going to learn a lot about others in the midst of failure. You're going to find out what is really inside of someone when they get squeezed because what's inside when people get squeezed always comes out. And nothing like failure will create that that volcanic activity of emotion to come out. Learn from that. Also, I would tell you, do the th- those things you need to do now in order not to fail again. It may be from the spiritual aspect of making commitment to prayer and Bible study and fellowship with other believers, a priority in your life. It may be not hanging around with a certain crowd because every time you're around them, you become more like them. The deal is, you know, kids, they become like the very people they hang around with. And guess what? That works for adults too. Adults begin to act like the very people they hang around with. And so therefore, if you're hanging around a crowd that's taking you down a dark hole, you need need some new friends. And therefore, you need to do those things you need to do in order for you not to fail again. Don't put yourself in a position of failure by walking the same path. Change directions. I would also tell you, adjust your attitude. Adjust your attitude to yourself, to the Lord, to others. Remember what Jesus said to Simon Peter. Watch this, Luke 22. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Do you realize that Jesus knew that Simon Peter was going to fail and fail miserably? He did. He just needed to remember the last thing that Jesus told him. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Failure is not the end of your life. It's just sometimes the springboard for the rest of your life. You realize that? God's got a plan for your life. He does. And sometimes we don't experience his plan until we fall flat on our face. And then we begin to experience what he planned for us as never before. You know what? It's hard for a person to give grace who has not experienced grace. You know what? I think that Simon Peter's life and his preaching was totally different because he knew what failure felt like. And when he called men and women to repent of their sin, he knew what he was saying because he was one of Jesus' satisfied customers. But here's the last thing. Take the next step. Take the next step. Let God use your failure in the lives of others. Let God use your failure in your own life. Let God use your failure for his kingdom. Because quite honestly, your failure may preach a greater sermon to other people as how you handle it than if you lived a life with no errors. Remember that. I think about this passage, and I think about reading it. It was our last devotional time together on the trip in Israel. We were at St. Peter Galancantu. It is the church that is built over the house of Caiaphas, where Jesus was brought from the Garden of Gethsemane after he was arrested down the Kidron Valley, up the side of the western part of the Kidron Valley, up those steps which are right by the courtyard of Caiaphas' house where Simon Peter denied Jesus. And he was taken and he was put into a pit 
interrogated by the Sanhedrin. We stood out there in that courtyard, and I read the story about Simon Peter denying Jesus three times. And the Scripture said, after he denied Jesus the third time, and he used profanity, the rooster crowed. And the moment I read that passage, like on cue, a rooster crowed. Ooh. Some of our people laughed. Some went, whoa. And today, just maybe, the rooster has crowed for you because God invited you to tune in today. He invited you to come in today because he wants you to handle failure in a positive way and begin again. I don't know where you are in your life, but God knows. Some of us this day, we need Christ as Lord of our lives. Some of us, we're carrying a heavy load, and we just need somebody to pray for us. Some of us are walking a dark time right now, and we just need somebody with skin on to come alongside us, and put their hand on us, and pray for us. Maybe that's where you are today. Or maybe you don't have a church home. You sense this is the church that God wants me to connect with. Maybe you've not taken that step of baptism to say, I belong to Christ. And you're ready to do that. I pray that wherever you are, that the rooster would crow and you would hear it and you would sense the Spirit of God drawing you to begin right now. Thanks for watching Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Visit higheraim.org for more free resources. There, you can access our daily devotions, sign up for our monthly teaching letter, even download the Higher Aim app, and so much more. Just go to higheraim.org to get started.